believe that was some great singing. Okay, we'll do another one. The Lord is one. I want everyone clapping. <laughs> Just look at Song Jung for the drum beat. into the new year. Please show us the way, Holy Father, to repair your world and world, and give us the strength and courage to take responsibility of spreading your message and your saving grace and love. I uh, report this on behalf of my brothers and sisters here, and in my name, Robert Haynes, husband of a breast less than central couple. Aren't you? <laughs> so, we got some announcements. Um, firstly, some dates of your diary. Um, next week, on the January the 15th, uh, we've got a discussion uh, in the cafe, um, exploring the government's flagship policy of um, big society and uh, how we as a community can contribute, make, a, make our own contribution. Um, so the title is What Will Make...
those of you who would like to help out more, do more for the community, I suppose, or you know, feel a calling to help in the cafe and the lunch. There's lots of serving and cooking and hiding up to do. Um, so if you'd like to uh, talk down to Eureka about that, to Eureka Hayashi. And then after the service today, we have a projects update. So um, those of you involved in different projects in this community and other communities or other different things, um, feel free to come along and have a share of what you've been doing. Um, there'll be, uh, Chigo will be sharing about MBU and um, Uncle Peter Graham will be talking about uh, the World Cultural Foundation. Um, so, I think that's Christ and that you can do great things in your life. And, um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy it and can connect to it as well.
So yeah, that's going to be a bit different today. I want to invite up some of our congregation to share a little bit about what makes them get involved in the good things that they do in their life. I don't want to, I'm not asking them so much to talk about what they do, but actually much more about why they do it. And I want to just remind us, especially also because it is the start of the year, of our mission statement that we have for our community that I guess I put together and I put it on our pastor's update every week, the email that you get from me. And, and so I just wanted to read that out. To discover our divinity and purpose through living an abundant life of loving service. So we're all striving to discover our divinity because as it says in Genesis, we're all made in God's image. And as we do that, to really get in touch with our purpose what it is I'm here on this earth to do, why I'm in the family I'm in, why I'm in the job that I'm in, and what I can contribute in that environment. And I want to also connect a little bit today to this whole topic of the, that we're reading about in the papers, that the papers aren't, generally speaking, particularly positive about, but the whole concept of the big society. And this is kind of the, it was the Tory party flagship policy at the during the election campaign, and it's something that they're still trying to develop, the, the government now. And to have a big society, uh, I guess, means to have a healthy society, really. We need to have a big heart, as people. Because a society, ultimately, is made up of a lot of people, and the groups that they like to form amongst themselves. And so, we not only need to have a big heart, but uh, you could say then we also need to have a healthy heart. And of course, everybody has a heart, but it's really a question of how can my heart, how can your heart find a way to grow, to enlarge them, to become larger, to become more generous in its capacity for others. And, you know, in the sense that that's possible, then we can have a big society. Personally, I believe that that's something that will bring about a big society much more than necessarily apportioning money here, apportioning money there, and, and so on and so forth. And, and of course, as a policy, it's something that some people think hasn't even taken off yet, some people think it's flagging, so what can we do to contribute to it? How can it be revitalised? And so that's the discussion that will be going on next Sunday afternoon in the cafe, it will be about that. And I want to, just as we... Yes, I'm not going to talk for too long today. I want a maximum 20 minutes, ideally 15 minutes from me, and then I'm going to really dedicate the rest of the time to those representatives from our community who I've invited to come and speak. Four people who are involved in projects, uh, involved in giving their energy, their time, to not just making their life good, but actually helping to make their environment around them better, to, to pass something on, from what's in their heart to those around them, in whatever, and, and you'll see, because they're all very different people, that it doesn't matter who we are, we can all find a way to do that. And of course, they're representative, because I know many, many of you are involved in so many fantastic projects, whether in your neighbourhood or even supporting projects abroad in other continents. And, and so, just really coming back to a little story that I want to share with you, because I think to have a big heart, we have to find a way to teach our heart. And that really means grasping the moments that, get, that take place in every day of our life. That as you go through the day, there's many, many moments that you can learn from, that I, I've found that I can learn from. And we can call these teachable moments. So I'm just going to share briefly about one that I had last week. So. Friday, Saturday last week, we had a seminar here about virtues and how to teach virtues and live virtues. And I was coming along Friday morning, started at 10, I'd taken the kids to school, popped home to get my bag, my wife got a really nice cup of Union coffee, you can only buy it on a cardo, the best coffee in London. And uh, I was walking to the bus stop, to the E1, to get to Evening Broadway. I noticed the top wasn't on properly, so I put it on firmly. And the bus arrived, the E1, opened its doors, I got on, I walked up the stairs, I've been smelling the coffee, I hadn't even taken a sip yet, and I was just 
in one moment I'm going to be sitting there drinking this beautiful cup of coffee. And this gentleman in front of me uh, was also walking up the stairs at the same time and he, I don't know what exactly he did, but he kicked his heel or did something and that cup of coffee went flying. It went on my coat. That's, anyway, I won't tell you where it's from, but it's a nice coat. Uh, on my trousers. And then it travelled and landed and exploded over the staircase. <laughs> and I just like, he basically went, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was, um, that was all I needed, that final, so it, it, it wasn't really kind of fitting for the, the drama that I just experienced. And, and so I froze and I didn't know what to do. And, looked at the mess and my coat and everything. I went up to the stairs and said, you know, it's a bit more than an accident, I said. I, I didn't know what to say. And, and then I, uh, he said, sorry again or something, vaguely. And I said, yeah, I guess it was an accident. And I was trying to communicate. He didn't know how to communicate. I don't know if he didn't care or just he's all, uh, emotionally uh, closed or something. Um, or, Lacking in compassion okay. or empathy. And so I went downstairs and I sat down. And, and of course, you know what it's like on a bus when someone's left something there and it starts to flood and it's like on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm sitting there with everyone at the bottom of the bus and, and I saw this lady from the corner of her, my eye picking up her handbag, looking rather uh, upset by the whole thing as well. And, yeah, I was just full of fury, to be honest, for quite a while. And, and of course, the memory of what the coffee was going to taste like. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I waited till everyone got off at the evening before I got off. And I watched the man walk down the road in front of the window. <laughs> and I came into the seminar, and because it was a seminar, I got to share about this with everyone, and that was helpful. <laughs> But the interesting thing, just to rewind for a second, was that earlier on that morning, I'd been at the kitchen table and my son had been having a cup of tea. And he had knocked it on the floor. And he'd actually been more concerned about his pyjamas and his top than about cleaning it up. And I wasn't, didn't get upset with him for knocking it over. But then me and then a bit my wife, we got a bit cross with him for not really getting involved in the cleanup operation. His little, almost two-year-old sister was on her knees scrubbing away, which wasn't a good idea. And, and so, that night when I went to bed, because actually we had a couple of friends stay, and he generously gave up his bedroom for one of our guests, and so he was in our bed that night, and I said to him, guess what happened to me today after I dropped you at school? And I told him the whole story, and I said to him, yeah, because we got a bit cross with you. And, and do you know what he told me? He said, yeah, I was late for school and actually I don't really know how to clean up something like that. He just said, very, you know, I had children on it, I didn't know how to clean it up. I thought, wow. And a light bulb went off in my head. Yeah, I didn't know how to deal with my situation either. And that gentleman also, who I've come to forgive, also didn't know how to deal with what he had caused. And so, I had a teachable moment where I realized that give people a bit of space and generosity and think about whether they really know how to deal with the situation. And maybe all of us, though we might seem grown up, are like that little boy who didn't really know how to clean up the mess. And and, and so a big society is basically, I think, then about not just the theory of being big-hearted, but being able to be big-hearted in real-life situations. When someone kicks your cup of coffee out of your hand on the bus. So next time, I hope it never happens again, but next time if it does, uh, I might be able to, based on that conversation I had with my son, be better at handling that awkward situation. And so, as we think about, again, the idea of a society and being a large group of people and what it means to be an individual, 
I just want to read you something, uh, to share a couple of other quick ideas with you about what it means to be an individual in a big group and, and, and how do you relate. So this is from John Adair, who's a really fantastic author and uh, I really recommend you read some of his books. And he says, individuals are just particular persons. Actually, the word individual has gone through a revolution of meaning. Coming from the Latin individuus, meaning indivisible, it was once used to emphasize that we are joined together. As individuals, we are inseparable. Now it stresses the exact opposite, namely that each person is an indivisible whole, existing as a distinct entity. So he says the ideology of individualism is based upon a half-truth. And he says it ignores the other half of the picture, that we are all members one of another. And then he quotes uh, the English religious poet Francis Qualis, who says, No man is born unto himself alone. Who lives unto himself, he lives to none. So just the very fact that you come together here to start your week, not alone, but together in a community with a congregation as brothers and sisters, is already a very big statement about how you want to live your life with other people in our big-hearted society. Because, you know, a lot of us, quite frankly, in this weather, could very easily be tucked up in the warmth and darkness of our duvet, alone, uh, but at the same time not together with others. And how we find our different ways to, to extend that friendship and that generosity is, is really a creative process uh, that often starts in the family. And so I just want to give you one more reading from uh, the autobiography from Reverend Samyang Moon. He talks about how he learned after walking, the first thing he learned to do was to serve food to other people. By the time I was born and was growing up, much of the wealth that my great-grandfather had accumulated was gone. And our fa family had just enough to get by. So anyway, I don't know if there's a correlation there with our British economy. It used to be quite wealthy. But a bit threadbare at the moment. The family tradition of feeding others was still alive, however, and we would feel we would sorry we would feed others even if it meant there wouldn't be enough to feed our family members. The first thing I learned after I learned to walk was how to serve food to others. During the Japanese occupation, many Koreans had their homes and land confiscated as they escaped the country to Manchuria, where they hoped to build new lives for themselves they would pass by our home on the main road that led to Sonchon in North Pyongyang province. My mother always prepared food for the passers-by who came from all parts of Korea. If a beggar came to our home asking for food and my mother didn't react quickly enough, my grandfather would pick up his meal and take it to the beggar. Perhaps because I was born into such a family, I too had spent much of my life feeding people. To me, giving people food is the most precious work. When I'm 18 and I see someone who has nothing to eat, it pains my heart and I cannot continue eating. So, I guess, in a sense, also when people used to live in village communities, it was maybe an easier kind of environment in which to live like that. Um, just before I invite up our testimony givers, I just want to read also from the book of James, where James is talking a lot about faith and also about what we do with our faith. And as a faith community, that's always a question that you know, we have to ask ourselves. And he says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, you know, as a words of encouragement, but does nothing actually about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied, if it is not accompanied by an action, is, as you know famously, it says, dead. So, like I said, many of you are involved in many good and great projects, and one of my goals for this year, one of my plans for the next six months as the pastor of this community, or 
just simply as a person in my community, uh, is to really look for ways to help people, to help community members be successful. I'm quite wary actually of coming up with some master plan for our community because hindsight or experience teaches me that it doesn't really work so well that way. And though I might sit in a meeting with some staff and we might come up with ideas, well, how can we shift the focus and the culture much more to the ideas and initiative coming from the congregation? So a, a great example in case is our New Year's Eve party, which was sort of concocted essentially by our staff committee, which you know includes me, includes, and it was a good party. I mean, it was it went well, especially um, some John's karaoke was a massive hit. Um, but uh, you know, to be frank, you know, I'm maybe not the best party planner. I actually son, I don't know. Would you put your hand up if you said, "Is there any party planners in the room?" We're not maybe the built to be party planners. <laughs> but then, a couple of people came up to me after who said that they'd like to help next time. And you know, I think we could shift the, the focus more to really putting the, the onus and the, the ball in everyone else's court in, in many situations like that. But of course, how do, you, how do you make that shift? And I guess asking some of you to come up here and testify to what motivates you to do good in your life, or to think beyond simply yourself, is maybe a, a way of trying to make a statement about that. So, I think maybe that's enough for me, and we'll invite them up. So, we've got John O'Neill, who is going to give a message, a little message, sorry, five minute testimony, um, first. And then we've got this on the service sheet, anyone can see it? Who's next? Chitty Toma, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, we've got Chigo and then Peter. So John does a lot of work with Morality Forum, with reaching out to churches and, and a, a lot of uh, different projects. Uh, but what I asked him to testify about is what motivates him. And so I've got some notebooks from him here, something he started a while ago. There's 18 books here, and I know a lot of you study God's Word in the morning, but he studies it in quite a significant way. These are his passages that he's picked out from True Father's words over the years, uh, and you know, I'm going to photocopy these for myself later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I leave this here as a testimony, as a symbol that they have uh, uh, devotion. That's John's devotion there. Um, and then um, after that, I'm going to ask Mitty, who's the director of our Women's Federation, and uh, of course, she's also a mother and a wife. And, does many other things uh, for our community. And, uh, and then we're going to invite up Chigo, who's uh, the president or the chairman, or anyway, the pioneer of uh, our football team, this football team, Mind Body United, which brings together young people from across London for uh, football. And, um, and uh, anyway, uh, he does a great job because bringing all those people together, I tell you, is not an easy job. And, and then finally we're going to have Peter Graham, who's a musician, but also he started the International Cultural Foundation, which does a whole bunch of different good work. So through his passion for music and the principle, he has been able to bring uh, people together to raise money for lots of different causes as well. And so, you know, I want to let him speak for himself. And uh, Mitty said, I don't know about the others, but she said she prefers to speak from down there. So I guess the rest of you, you want... You can stand there or up here, depending on what you feel most comfortable with. And, uh, and so, I think, yeah, I hope you can see this as a chance to listen to each other. And uh, I hope you can feel that they represent also yourself as they speak. And um, let's invite John to get the ball rolling. Five minutes, and uh, I'm going to talk about the moral issues. That's my main uh, main thing that I'm involved in. But I also would say, actually, the number one thing that I like doing is witnessing. That's my number one thing I love doing the most. 
I've had seven people in recent months on the Monday seminar with Jack, and they all were very inspired. And one minister of mine, he asked me, he wanted to join our church. I didn't ask him, he joined and he signed membership. So that to me is what I get the most uh, inspiration from, and I love doing the most. But as I said, we, we, we've only got a short time, so I've written it down to get more in if I can. And as I said, I'm focused on this Morris, because a lot of it is Father's words involved here. So I'm sure we can get a lot from that. So um, I support various moral groups as well as being the coordinator of the Marathi Forum. When the religious ethos was prepared, so the, the question Simon asked is what motivates you to do what you do? So this will be explained as I read this. When a religious ethos was prevented in Britain in the 1950s, people could safely walk the streets and divorces and teenage pregnancies were rare. Since the 1950s, there's been a tenfold increase in crimes and enormous increases in social problems. Statistics show that no society in history has been able to survive for long without a strong moral code. A study of 88 civilizations in the 1940s by Professor Unwin from Cambridge University concluded that whenever there was widespread promiscuity, premarital sex, infidelity and same-sex relationship, the civilization was dead within three, with no, within three generations with no exceptions. The permissive society and the sexual revolution has been a disaster for our nation. Britain has the highest rates of teenage pregnancies, divorces and STDs in Europe. STDs amongst our young people are at epidemic levels 35% incurable. Immorality is rampant, pornography is everywhere, amoral sex education programs in many schools take away the purity and innocence of our children, priming them for sex. Young people being stabbed to death in our streets, some even in broad daylight. The answer to all these problems in our nation desperately need a religious ethos to be prevalent again. Religious people should be at the forefront in challenging evil in society. We are meant to be the conscience of the nation. In the Bible it tells us, love your neighbour as yourself. If our neighbours are being dragged into hell because of the permissive society, we cannot sit still doing nothing. Bruno Klotz, our National Society, and in this very room on one holy day a few years ago, the moral groups are doing our work and we should support them. Far, too far, too far those words now. When Satan strikes, we have to hit back ten times harder. Our responsibility is to tell people the truth. If they do not listen, then God will judge them. So we have to tell people, politely with love, but politely, uh, but straight Give them the facts. All religious people should feel responsible for the shaky spiritual foundation of this generation and should repent. Throughout the long history of religion, we've not made a convincing witness for our living God. Our past hypocrisy has allowed atheism to prevail. We should feel deeply guilty about all this. Today God is calling us, all religious people, standing on the internal foundation of self-reflection and repentance should challenge the prevalence of all evils and, I emphasize and, work creatively in order to realize God's will on earth. The living God wants to relate with us not merely in the context of scriptures and rituals, but rather dwelling in the hearts of people who keep God's will in their minds and live it in their everyday life. Amen. So I believe we gain a lot of energy and spiritual growth in dealing with these moral issues. I've given out together with my friend Mr. Murphy at the back there, this wonderful bulletin from the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. And there's a helpline there to help uh, parents with children in school to protect their children from harmful sex education. So these groups, they're doing our work and I feel the least I can do, based on Father's words, is to do my best to help and support them. So as I say, I feel a privilege to give out this to people. Many, many parents have said to you, thank you so much. They know it's a contentious issue and they don't know what to do about it. So this, this helpline, this lady uh, gives talks uh, all over the country and they can get real help from that. So uh, the other angle that Simon says is how do you overcome your limitations? Well, if I, think, if I really think about my limitations, maybe I think uh, I've got no hope, but I, I look... So what the two points I would emphasise to overcome my limitations is looking at Father's life and, and reading his words and learning from others. Those three points. So Father's, what's Father's greatest tactic? Does anybody know? Perseverance. Yes, exactly. He perseveres. He never gives up. So those that, he says, those that persevere will eventually succeed. 
He says those that repent every day are growing even though they do not realize it. So if we repent, we, we, we grow. We're growing. So key points to overcome our limitations. We need to make conditions. Father asks us to do one and a half hours of Honda pay every morning from five o'clock. By keeping this condition, we can gain much strength and energy which can help us to overcome our limitations. Father asks us to learn from those that are successful. He also tells us to challenge the things that we do not like doing. So if you don't like witnessing, you know what you have to do. But also, the key point is learn from others. Those that are successful, hook up with them, learn from them, inherit from them. So Father went through severe torture to further God's will. What we are asked to do is very small in comparison to what Father went through. So the principle is the ultimate answer to all the problems and suffering in the world. So we should take heart from that. That's why I said, for me, the most blessing, uh, dealing with these moral issues, I gain a lot of strength and energy. I feel I should do that. But the number one thing for me is actually going out on that street, talking about God's love, talking about the principle, being to true love, and the principle can solve all the problems and change this world. So by having a vibrant, focused, motivated spiritual life and having clear goals, we can overcome our limitations. Continuity is the key. So I'll finish now with uh, some very clear words from our true father. When your determination is big and your actions brave, you will have a great result. If you truly dedicate yourself for the sake of God and humanity, there is nothing to be afraid of. In order to come to the year of victory, one needs to be equipped with a fighting spirit, a driving power. If we live a, a year like this and then continue on, it will eventually add up to 10 years, then 20 years and 30 years. And that becomes the path of our life. Thank you.
I think the um, thing that motivates me is my passion for that. You know, it's not a huge thing, but um, about studying the scriptures and things like that. I don't do so much, if I'm honest about it. I don't do as much, I'm not clear, I should. But uh, I feel the seeds are already there when I heard the principle in the beginning. Already, I, when I made the decision to join this, this, take this path, it's there, you know? And you just have to n nurture them and shine them. And of course you need the truth and but also you need action, you know, you have to feed your spirit through meeting other people and, and uh, it's, it's the whole issue about, you know, getting real vitality elements so that your spirit and it grows, you know, and uh, so, um, so the principle teaches all those things to us. So, um, what drives me, and uh, being a mother, of course, I have to take responsibility for my children, also my <coughs> husband, all those things are very important as well, and uh, I need their support, and vice versa, I have to support them in their, their wishes. And sometimes it's not always aligned with what is in the community, but then you have to go beyond, because, uh, you know, we have a, like some boundaries, but some people go out of the boundaries, it doesn't make them a bad person, it's just they're different, you know, and then um, to be flexible, to be caring, that you're okay, you know, that... Um, we're all going to the same goal. We only have the one God, and, uh, and we are the one family, and we have to care for each other. So those are the simple little principles that I follow, you know, and uh, that motivate me. And doing the Women's Federation activities, it's a, quite an honor, I felt. I felt really, um, I could God well, train me, you know, in many ways. I would never do public speaking. I would never, you know, would find it really difficult to have a long term conversation with you. But I felt it was it was an opportunity that God was giving you can do it, you know, try. If you don't try, you, you never know. So um, I think it's not a, it's not that complicated really. And sometimes it's much in, in ourselves that we make it complicated or we expect others to do something. As always, I'm sure you know this quote from Gandhi, if you want to see the change you have to be the change. So I, I kind of live by that kind of ethos, you know, that it's quite simple, but it's sometimes it's very difficult to practice. So I think I can do it there. Thank you. <laughs> 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 well, I said she goes to the football team, uh, of course, I, I don't know if some of you might know, but he's also been involved in a lot of other projects in Europe, even going to Israel and so on and so forth. So, anyway. Bit more of an introduction. Hi. Uh, so uh, Simon spoke to me. Okay. So Simon spoke to me about a week ago, asking me to say what more to say. And um, I've been thinking about it before, but I was really relaxed thinking about it. I didn't rush too much to figure it out. But once Simon told me, I kind of had a crash for us. I had to figure it out quick. And today, I still haven't completely figured it out, but um, one thing which I know is what really drives me, or how I feel, is that I'm really lucky in life. I'm blessed. Somehow or another, everything has worked out well for me. And there has been bad things, but I mean, that's not, that doesn't really affect the way I live my daily life necessarily. And I don't know, all I can think about is I'm just so lucky in life. I mean, my parents are great. My siblings are great. My friends are great. I mean, I'm even grateful for friends I have on Facebook because that shows that someone cares. And someone, <laughs> likes your, and someone likes your Facebook status. It shows that someone's thinking about it. Believe it or not, these small things. And sometimes I think I'm actually quite naive, but it's not being naive, it's being optimistic. I think that's something which is lacking a lot. Sometimes it's easy to see being realistic as being pessimistic. They mix them up with each other. Um, I don't know, like, the reason why I do these things is because at the end of the day, I want to be a better person. Everyone wants to be a better person. The football team, okay, it doesn't help me become like Gandhi or anything, but <laughs> I've learned a lot from it. Um, just yesterday, I had a bit of an experience where um, I work really late hours and I come home at maybe six in the morning and I got home maybe six, half past six, and I woke up at about eight o'clock to go to training. And I wrote a message to all the players, I was like, this time, we need to be more than six people. We 
have to come to training. Because you know it's Christmas, everyone's a bit chubby, everyone's <laughs> and we need to we need to train if we want to be successful. And I arrived there, there were only like three, four people. And you can ask anyone who was there, I did not talk for like maybe 10, 15 minutes. And I was just so angry because I actually felt like they didn't care about me. It actually hurt me a lot. It was a very small thing. But then they just came late. I was late. And they just were a bit more late than I was. And my mood just changed so quick. And I realized that's, that's what life should be like. People, small things like that should bring you joy. And that's what makes me happy. That's why I do it, because it makes me happy. It's a very simple guy. I'm a very simple guy. Like, it, takes, it doesn't take much to make me happy. A cake can make me happy for a whole day. A whole day me <laughs> so these small things make me happy. I mean, I also volunteer in Rick Crisis at Christmas. It's a homeless, it's not a shelter. I mean, it's just a whole program. Homeless people get hairdressers, podologists, they get musicians come in and sing for them, they have talks with them, play games with them. And for the last two years, I've been doing it on Christmas Day, which should be the day you spend with your family. But since I don't live here, and my family are abroad, I say my nice soul with the homeless people. But the reason why I do it is because I can see myself in them. Some of the reasons why people are homeless is because they're just in a foreign country. I'm in a foreign country. Some of them, the reason why they just call this is they just couldn't contact friends, someone they couldn't they couldn't find a place to stay. And I've had that problem, trust me, I've had that problem where I moved to London, I'm like, where am I gonna live? I should have thought about that before. <laughs> I've had that problem too. But luckily, just I'm so blessed to have friends. I'm so blessed to have people who care about me. I'm so blessed to be in the community. And I think that's all all that really inspires me, all that really keeps me going. Because at the end of the day, I have these big plans on how I want to change the world and everything. But, I mean, it's the only, only way I can start is from the community. My dad always says family starts, sorry, charity starts at home. And I believe in that, totally. I'm not the greatest person, but the few gifts I have, or whatever, the few things I'm a bit to that, I should use them to serve the community. I mean, I hate sleeping. You can ask anyone here. If I could sleep two hours a day and be okay, I'd be alright. I want all the time in the world to do everything possible. Everything. But, unfortunately, I can't do that. Um, but, the way I see it is we should really take our time and really use it well. And I like, I try to use my time well, as much as possible, even though there's many temptations. And, yeah, in two weeks I'm turning 25. And last year, um, I was in the shop. And this little kid, man, I don't even know what it was about. And he was like, this man. And he pointed at me and was like, man, me. I did not realize that I'm a man until like 24. I thought I saw that was a teenager. It's, it was such a big thing for me. He's like, I can't believe that kid called me man. And I realized I should be a lot more responsible. I mean, I'm going to be 25. That's quarter of a century. What have I done? Justin Bieber is 16. <laughs> and it sounds like a joke, but it's not a joke to anybody. He's got so many followers. He can change lives and he's 16. I'm 25, what have I done? Started a football team, volunteered a couple of Christmases. That's nothing. There's so much more to do. So that's what motivates me, the fact that I'm so lucky that I should be able to spread it. And I have so much more to do. So, sorry, it's not such a high, like, Amazing idea, but that's it's a very simple one. I'm so lucky, so why shouldn't other people be as lucky as me? So that's all. Thank you. We have our own <coughs> hopes, desires, we have our own um, essence, which uh, is only something I can express, only you can express. And uh, I think 
through my course of, of life, it, I, I've combined that feeling plus uh, a, a faith, a belief that God is actually guiding my life. And um, there's been certain key moments where I, I could have made a decision to do something or do something else. Something has been presented to me, an opportunity. Well, at that point, I actually have prayed and asked God, really, try to really ask God, what is the best now for, for my personal eternal happiness, if you like, that if I took this decision or not. And uh, I just haven't really been able to move until I felt very comfortable and uh, confident. Yeah, that is, the right, that is the right thing to do. And that happened to me, certain key points, like with, uh, with music was one of them, and then for years I was really dedicated for music. And, but the thing is, something else came along, but I didn't abandon that. No, just add on top of it. Like, it's easy for us to have a project, and then, okay, I'm doing that, and then something else comes along. Okay, yeah, that's what I'll do. And then you drop that and carry on. But actually, I think we should build up layers. I feel like I've been building up layers. And uh, never abandon the original, the original um, inspiration. But just develop. So, like, for me, music developed into an interest in culture. I, I had to really decide, should I be responsible for a, a small little island in the Pacific. It's <laughs> just something completely different. How does that connect? Should I just abandon my music and do it? But no, I never did that. Uh, but I just took that on top. Uh, and then I discovered uh, a situation about uh, the suffering of other people. It took a long time to discover that, just a couple of years ago. And uh, particularly about China, it really, really moved me to realize how um, the Buddhists were being persecuted in China. And uh, so I wanted to do something about that, but at that point also I, I had to like pray, I mean, how can I do something? What could I do? But actually I added the, the, the layers of music and, uh, uh, and culture, and then human rights, it just came on top. Uh, and I feel that for each of us, uh, God wants us to find out who we are and wants us to really find out what am I able to do that is unique. Because we all have something. We all have something that we, only us, can do. And that could be a hobby as well. You might be a, a train spotter. I used to do train spotting. You know, catch different numbers of trains. Well, okay, there's lots of people like that, but there's a, there's, you can involve that. In a, in a, a series of, uh, uh, of societies or whatever you join, but whatever it is, you need to try and be deep and meaningful about it and, and add on to what you do. So I think I finished my five minutes, and uh, I just hope it could give a hint, something. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much, all of you, for that, and all of you for listening to them and listening to them share something from inside themselves. And like I said uh, earlier on, I'm really thinking about what my role is in our community this year and how it's not to create a master plan for all of us to follow, mm -hmm. but to really see how I can help all of us to be successful together, how I can help us to collaborate. Now, when you saw those four brothers and sisters speak, you can see how different we all are. And ever since I've been a teenager and been part of this group and that group and that group and this group, I've always had this dream of how can people come together. And, and so I just want to read another little thing here that I read this morning, which is that one of the deep attractions of teamwork or being part of a group or a community is precisely that membership of a good team <coughs> does allow us to transcend our own individual limitations, our own limitations of ability and performance. And this is something from a manager in a business setting, but nevertheless talking about being in a group. The joy of working harmoniously with small groups of people who are dedicated to something bigger than themselves 
and are completely loyal to each other. Counts in my experience at work are, as one of the most rewarding things of my life. I think many of us could agree with that when we've experienced working together with others in a harmonious way that's extended us from being just ourselves to being something much greater than ourselves. And so this year I really want to see how as a community we can work towards greater collaboration. So this meeting we have at 1.15 today after lunch is really for anyone who's interested to know more about the projects people do in our community. I think actually Chigo won't be there because he's got to go to back to work, right? Uh, um, he's got to be in acting or work, but you know. There are a bunch of people who are doing that. Marshall will be speaking about what he does with weight, with the performance programs that they do and all the teaching that they provide. And any of you who have something to share, come along and share it, all come along and listen. And if you can't, don't worry, uh, there will be other opportunities. And, and just really I want to see how we can develop a process through how we help each other to really be successful in doing good. Uh, not just for our own life, but for um, the environment that we find ourselves in in our daily life. So, join me in a prayer to finish. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we pray now together, we, we pray because we want to concentrate our heart and mind uh, as a collective, as a group, towards you, to, to attract your attention in this moment and to, to say something to you, Heavenly Father, about <coughs> ourselves. We want to really be the lights in our family, in our community, in our city, in our nation, Heavenly Father. Lights like the light that a candle gives off, Heavenly Father, that helps, to, helps people to see when things are, are dark or, or, or not so bright. Heavenly Father, I pray that however windy it becomes uh, in our lives this year, that we can keep our lights shining and that they never go out. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you can protect and guide everyone, everyone here through their week. We pray for our true parents who are in Korea right now. We pray for their health and their, uh, their safety. We pray for our Queen here in Britain and for our Prime Minister. We pray for their physical and spiritual health as well. And we pray that as we go into this week, we can all find many teachable moments that enhance our lives, that allow us to become bigger hearted and more generous in our spirit. I pray we report all these things to you, Heavenly Father. I pray my name is Simon Cooper, Best Central Okay. So thank you very much everyone. We'll just have some time for reflection now as the band come up and we'll have our free song. So, if you'd like to uh, pay your tithing off if you want to do that today, and um, invite the band to come and play.
Bye, everyone. I hope you all have a great week and an even happier year. <laughs>